Hello Booktube, I'm Scott. And now we are Gunpowder Fiction and Plot, and today it's our Friday Reads, which will probably be uploaded on a Sunday, Saturday, Top whatever. One of them. So, last week I didn't do a shout-out, and I said I was going to do two shout-outs this week. Firstly, I want to say, like, last week I said I, I was a bit behind on Booktube, um, and one of the first things I did was watch Claudia at Spinster's Library's Task Mistress video. Ooh, that was good. Um, and Claudia doesn't really need a shout out because she's massive, but everybody who hasn't watched it yet should yeah, it was good. watch it because it, it, when somebody does a special video like that, it deserves recognition and it was really good. And and people should watch it and enjoy the, the amount of effort that would have gone into that, you know? And just, it was a good, entertaining video. It was very funny, and it's based on the Taskmaster show, um, which... Is funny. Which is funny, and yeah. Yeah. Um, shout out number two, so I've gone for um, one of the booktubers we subscribed to first, to one of the booktubers we've subscribed to last. As in most recently. Most Not recently. Not as in really or forever. Last week, um, on Sean the Book Maniac's Friday Reads, he shouted out... DJ at Indian Cooks and Books. Oh, he's so good! And, oh yeah, I tell you what, we subscribed, and I just want to, like, reinforce that shout-out. So if you didn't subscribe to DJ when Sean shouted him out, subscribe now. now. His taste in books is just... Mm. (laughs) Scott agrees with his taste in books. Therefore, it's correct. Um, I really like the way he uh, gets behind a book that he likes. Yeah. You know? Enthusiasm. Yeah. Plus plus. Yeah. Really good. All right. Um, now, finished this week. Now, how many books did you finish this week? I finished two. Nice. What did you finish? Tell me about that. Uh, I finished a Transition Baby, which feels like it took me, like, months, but it didn't actually take me that long. Um, did you like it? Yes. But I feel like I would have liked it more if I read it before Daryl. Yeah, I was a bit worried about that as the order yep. that you've read them in after I... I just feel like, as far as um, a lot of the most intense ideas from Detransition Baby were, like, the least intense ideas from Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> For... Not not necessarily for any other measure than most foreign to a cis person's brain, I guess. Um, a straight cis person's brain. Uh, so I do feel like I a little bit didn't have quite as big a wow factor as you did when you read it. But yeah. it was still a very well written, um, interesting, character-based book. Yeah. Uh, and so it was enjoyable and like right up there with my top reads of the year, for sure. So it's a really good read. It's a really good it's read. It's just been I just, by something even better. Yeah, I just think it would. I would have. I would have gotten that real rush from it if I read it before I read Daryl. And is this the first time you've read millennial fiction? Oh, I don't. I don't know because I think that's a dumb term. <laughs> Sorry. Um. Yeah, I think it's an excellent book. I, I think it's an excellent, excellent book. And it's an excellent book. Yes. Um, should we, like, talk about the plot and stuff for people who don't know? Um, if you have been living under a rock, maybe? Or maybe you're new to booktube. I don't know. Um, maybe we're one of two booktube channels they watch. Or maybe, who knows. But Detransition Baby is about um a trans woman who detransitions uh, and so goes back to presenting as a man uh and then has a relationship with his boss who is a cisgender who is a cisgendered woman and gets her pregnant uh the idea of being a father just sets off gender dysphoria plus plus um and so he reaches out to his previous girlfriend who is a trans woman um and tries to create like a parenting throuple and that's the premise yeah 
Um, which, even without the trans and gender identity conversation going on there, that is a complicated discussion about parenting and the nuclear family and, like, what could be possible for people who don't assume what it's going to look like. Yeah. Um, and so... And then you add in the trans element and it gets even more complicated. What did you think about Katrina being part of the LGBT plus acronym? Because her partner was. Oh, yeah, but... Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. I'm not a queer person, so it's not really my... I just I wasn't asking you to have I wasn't asking you to say whether that was right or wrong I was just I just thought it was a really interesting a really interesting definition of what counts as as queer I mean and and I thought that that then by that definition it pushed the definition of what is not queer, really down into a very narrow I mean, what box. is not queer is a narrow box. It's a yeah. tiny little box that we've tried to push our whole society into and use as the framework for capitalism, and it's dumb. Yeah. Dumb. Uh, so that was book number one, and then book number two I finished last night. I finished The Grace Keepers, which I've been reading for even longer. Um, which was an enjoyable book. It's about, um, it's set in like a like a water world, like a post-climate change environment, except it doesn't really imply that it's... Well, I mean, I guess it does imply that it's post a um, sort of slow apocalypse and water levels rising and all that sort of stuff. And then we follow two characters. One um, a woman who has never lived on land and um, she is part of a traveling circus that is a boat that goes from island to island because that's all the land that's left are these tiny islands um uh and she dances with her trained bear um and they live together on the boat with all the circus people so that is one character and then the other character is a grace keeper hence the title and a grace keeper is kevin costner (laughs) a grace keeper is like a funeral director but for um, they call people who live on water damplings and there's like a real class divide between damplings and landlocked people are damplings under or over? no they all live on boats oh un- under or over they're, they're, the, they're the shit kickers they're, they're, they're the underclass the underclass the yeah. people who have land and therefore can grow food <laughs> um, uh, are the the upper class. class. Yeah. Um, but damplings aren't allowed to be buried on land. So they have um, their own sort of funeral ritual, um, which is overseen by a grace keeper. And so the other character is a grace keeper who is actually from landed people. Yeah. Um, anyway, so the two meet and then things happen. Yeah. So. Yeah, it wasn't, like, definitely compared to the other things I'm reading at the moment, it's not super serious, but it was um, sort of a look of what our world might eventually look like. Um, I really enjoyed the characters and, like, the real backstories they created, but I felt like for sort of a fantasy-esque book, they could have, we could have had some more time learning about even like the ritual that the grace keeper oversaw like we sort of got a, a vague idea of what she did but there was no real law behind it or that sort of exploration that you often get in sort of a more fantasy based novel um so i feel like it was missing a little bit of that sort of thing just to ground you a bit more in the environment and that made it feel like it needed a sequel or it needed a do you know what i mean Mm. Um, but I really liked the characters 
and um, it ended well, and it was it was fun, but it just felt a little bit light, I guess. That one is recommended, but not quite as strongly as Detransition Baby, or yeah, it's yeah. a good book, just a bit lighter. All right, now I have read a bunch of books for a secret project. Secret so project. So I can't talk about them. But... Shh. But I do have books to talk about. Um, I deliberately read books to talk about on Friday Reads. Uh, just shut up and talk about books. <laughs> um, Before I punch you. <laughs> I finished White Teeth by Zadie Smith. Mm-hmm. I feel like this was a slow burn. Um, now, I want to know, is slow burn code for boring as shit until the second half? Uh, it, it wasn't boring. It wasn't boring, but I, I won't say that the second half was better than the first half, but it just took me a long time to get into this book. Yeah. And when I got into it, um, I think I spoke about this book on our la- a video last week about it, and Courtney said that she DNF'd it after 100 pages or something about there, that she couldn't relate to the characters. And... I've got to tell you, I completely understand and empathise with that point of view because I was pretty much there and I was considering DNFing it at that point and I'm glad that I kept going because more characters are introduced and then there's too many characters in this book for me but they weave this really interesting elaborate web like, you know you know when one character is relatively pointless until you like look at them in the context of what other characters are there and how they... what the individual characters portray. Um, so it's sort of like a portrait of Britain in the um, late 80s and early 90s. Um, it focuses on the Indian, Pakistani, Bangladesh, she like the subcontinent culture, but it also focuses on the Caribbean culture and the white culture and it's showing you the like the interactions and the differences between those cultures and that, I found that quite interesting um, and it's it's about religion and it's about so many different things it's a very complex novel and whenever I say one thing about it I'm like oh, but it's not really about that it's you know yeah. there's a mouse in it and Science and um, anyway, I ended up quite enjoying White Teeth, and it, it definitely came back for me once I started to appreciate some of the things that were going on. Really cool. Um, then I read Exciting Times by uh, Nisha Ronan, uh, sorry, by Nisha Doolan, and I quite enjoyed this book too. Um, this is about a young Irish girl living in. Hong Kong, and she is in a relationship with a man who is quite a few years older than her. There is a real power difference between the two of them, um, and the relationship is very broken in that he doesn't say that they're in a relationship, but she is living in his house rent free and having sex with him. Right? Um, that is the first part of this book and and you get to see that relationship and where that's going to go and then he moves to London as part of his job for a bit and keeps his flat in Hong Kong where she's living and pays for it, leaves his credit card there and you get to see what she gets up to without the credit card and um, so Without the supervision. Without the supervision of her not-boyfriend. Yeah. Which may include meeting a girl. And uh, then the fireworks and the interesting part of the plot happens when he returns and she has two different relationships that are incredibly different going on at once. Mm-hmm. Um, this was really quite smartly done with the conversations about racism and class I've seen a few reviews of this saying that it is racist and I think that that's completely wrong. A book can have racism in it without it being 
racist. I think that that's an important distinction that your characters can yeah. be racist as a demonstration of racism without that being the book is racist. Um, and that is my interpretation of it, but I've seen other people interpret it differently. So I will put a, a little warning out there. It does compare the plight of the Irish to the plight of the people from Hong Kong and China. And that is an interesting comparison and it's an interesting discussion. And I really like that. But... Um, yeah, I thought this was a really interesting book, um, and I am quite happy to have read it. Good. Um, and then the last book I finished this week was Atesha Moshbeg's Atesha Moshbeg's My Year of Rest and Relaxation. I thought you'd already read this. Uh, I've been meaning to read this for a while. Mm. Um, and this was absolutely excellent. Um, this is about a woman who is so over society and her life that she decides to sleep for a year. I mean, I hear that. Yeah. Oh, she was an insufferable, horrible character and I related to her so much, which is not the right thing, <laughs> but <laughs> she's a mythanthro. She is just... Oh. I mean, and you see what I have to live with. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that I agree with everything she did in it, but there have been times that I have been tempted. The cops? No, it's the ambulance. It's the ambulance? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, there have been times where I've been tempted to take a dump in the office of my ex employer, too. <laughs> um. I thought you were going to say in the office of my factory, and I was like, <laughs> of my Dude, we sell food. Who is myself? <laughs> yes. Um, oh, terrible and terrifying. Um, this was just a wonderful depiction of depression. Um, there was this lovely friendship in it um, that was equal parts horrible and lovely, depending on which part of the friendship you looked at it from. Like, oh, great. Um, yeah, but I just the character portrait that this was was I really, really liked it. Um, I thought it was it was complex and it just it saw something that not a lot of people get. Um, and obviously, it's you know, it's a story about substance abuse and depression as well. Because how do you sleep for a year without some kind of substance? Um, I think the criticism of this book has to be the heavy-handed and abrupt ending, which is really, really obvious what's happening. I mean, yeah. if you think about when this book is set and where this book is set, the ending is just... It's so obvious what, how it's going to end. Is, is all like... It's, yep. it's set in New York in 2000 and 2001. How do you think it's going to end? Yeah. Um, like... Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, it's very heavy handed, but uh, I think a lot of books struggle with the ending. At least this book knew where it was going to end and made an effort to. I don't know if that's an at least, but okay. At least it foreshadowed. I don't think an end, like a, a bad ending doesn't always make a mess of the whole thing, in I my opinion. When you're talking about a character portrait, there, there really isn't not like. It's, it's impossible to do an ending there, yeah? Like, if you're doing a character portrait as your novel, like... I I don't agree, and I think that I could... That's totally a series of videos that we should make. We should just write down the sweeping statements that you make in our other videos, and then, like, Scott's sweeping statements and the eight books that disprove them. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I'm not sure if the quality of this channel can deal with me not saying dumb things. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I feel like our um, our regular viewers would get some kind of catharsis out of me just going, here's a pile of books. <laughs> All right. All right. So for our, our midweek video this week, there's going to be character portraits that actually have good endings. Yeah. All right. All right. 
Uh, if you've got any suggestions, leave them in the comments. Make Nell's job easier. Yeah, go on. <laughs> <laughs> also, cool Scotty dummy. No, this is fun. <laughs> I mean, I didn't actually think through that statement. No, you, but you say things like that all the time. Yeah. It's, you know, it's one of my favourite things. Um, I also DNF'd a book. Mm-hmm. Uh, I DNF'd Thinking About It Only Makes It Worse by David Mitchell. That is David Mitchell, the comedian, oh. and not David Mitchell, the author, although technically. Yeah. Um, David Mitchell was my favourite comedian in my 20s. I view him as a less Stephen Fry-ish Stephen Fry in that. Yeah, okay. You know, if Stephen Fry didn't exist... We'd need to replace him, and the obvious person to replace him with is David Mitchell. Yeah? No, it's the sweary man who put his fist in the ice. You know who I mean. We've watched that documentary 40,000 times where they proved that taboo words are more effective for pain relief, pain relief by putting their fist in the ice. And it was Stephen Fry and the sweary man, and... Oh, the and when with they were a loud like, voice. yes, and um, and when they said table, 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 Brian table, Blessed, Brian Blessed, and you know that's who would replace him. But I understand your argument for David Mitchell. Um, but I have to tell you, look, if you like David Mitchell, don't read this book because <laughs> he reveals that he's not very progressive and he's uh, a bit wishy washy. Well, firstly, trigger warnings. I don't know. I don't know. I want to say anti-Semitism. And David Mitchell would defend it as anti-Semitism and, and point out that I was wrong. But I really think that... He's anti-Semitic. I mean, it's not coming from a place of hatred. It's coming from a place of ignorance. But he hasn't taken the time to learn and to listen to the other side of the yeah, argument. Yeah, and if you're going to get on a soapbox and talk about an issue that you don't understand, then that is actually... Like, that is an act of disrespect. That is an act of putting your need to talk about, to hear your own voice, yeah. above the needs of Jewish people. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, let's talk about the incident, because I think it's, I think it's not a particularly great video to not talk about. So, David Mitchell is basically, what he's doing in this book is getting bits and pieces of the news and critiquing them and having opinions on them. And... Which is basically what his comedy always is anyway. Yes. Usually, it is about stuff that is relatively irrelevant, and he can be irreverent about... Why do buses always smell like feet? Yes. Yeah, whatever. Why do we have a low-fat version of lasagna? We know lasagna's unhealthy. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, that sort of stuff. And I'm, I could be down with that sort of... Yeah, ridiculous. Like, Ranting because I enjoy it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I He's, he's very good at that. But I... An Israeli couple went to London on holidays and they visited Madame Tussauds. And Madame Tussauds, and I think Madame Tussauds is actually 90% of the problem here. Because they have a waxwork Hitler. Yeah. And that is problematic. And these people were doing fascist salutes near Hitler and taking photographs of it. And, and Tussauds encourages you to like... Take photos with all the wax things. Yeah. yeah. But unless you're punching Hitler in the face, what, what pose is actually appropriate? Exactly. Yeah, yeah kicking him in the nuts. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's it. Um, anyway, Mitchell criticised that because um, the people, one of the people posing was doing the, the moustache thing, which he said is about mocking Hitler. Hitler. Um, I completely think it is. He, but... but um, the thing is, I just I just don't agree that somebody's ability to tell a harmless not a it's not harmless rather a pointless joke yeah right is more important than somebody's ability to like n not remember a trauma like, yeah to be able to go out in public without being faced with the like multi-generational impacts of the Holocaust. Yeah. Which I'm sure, I, like, they're confronted with all over the fucking place regard without going to Madame Two Swords and seeing, like, it's just, it's so dumb. Like, why? Yeah. 
And then Mitchell doubled down and said, and without mocking the Nazis, we wouldn't have had Dad's Army. We wouldn't have had that episode of Forty Towers. We wouldn't have had this, this, this. And, and I'm like, come on, stop. <laughs> stop telling me all the things I can't enjoy anymore, you bastard. Um, yeah, I just... So I decided to stop reading it because I didn't hate him at the point that I stopped. <laughs> and you didn't want to. I didn't want to hate him. And... He might have redeemed himself, but I want to know that in three months' time when we're, like, watching some UK panel show and David Mitchell is a contestant, I'm not going to go, you bastard, I'm going to go, oh, the guy that can mock irrelevant shit and I laugh at. Yeah. That's that's what I want. Yeah, get back in your, uh, your wheelhouse. But I'm... And I was really disappointed when I found out that his comedy partner, Robert Webb, was a turf. And yeah, that upset me. I just... And, because I actually thought of the two that he would be the progressive one. Robert Ware. Yeah. I think that he is, to be honest. He just... He's a massive turf. I just... To be honest, he, he's not actually said he's a turf. He said he's a gender-critical feminist, which... Which is a turf. What, what does that mean if it's not a turf? Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, I just... Man, can my childhood heroes just not be shit people? Not even childhood. That was my 20s. Yeah. Can people I like not be shit? Thank you. I mean, they made that show. It was pretty shit. Peep show. You're a horrible person. You know that? <laughs> I did like the one where they were ambassadors. The ambassadors. Oh, is that what it was called? Yeah. That was funny. But peep show was not good. Yeah, you just... You're just wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are you going to play a game now? Immediately prior to filming, we watched a couple of YouTube videos. Yeah. One was Sean's Friday Reads, which he shouted out a channel called Shelf Possessed. Shelf Possessed is a couple talking about books. Which we love. Which, I tell you, like, we're just biased towards yeah, it's a good checking thing. those things out. Anyway, we watched uh, their TBR, um, and... They did this cool thing. They're an excellent channel and you should check them out. But we've only watched one video, so... Um, but they did this cool thing with... On their TBR, they gave each other a present. And it was a book. And the other person was going to read the book. That month. So once a month, they give each other a book and they set the TBR. Yeah. So what we decided to do was to make a game out of that. Like, to take that... And turn it into a game. Turn it into a game. You're going to see how it goes this month, and we might do this semi-regularly. So, Maybe. Let's see how it goes. I've picked two books for Nell. Nell has picked two books for me. We're only going to read one book, but what we're doing is... Have you, have you gone into a bookshop and you've seen a mystery date with a book where you get... It's like always wrapped in shitty brown paper, and they write like three words on it with text art. Um to give you a clue as to what kind of book it is and you pick based on that and there's always like some guarantee of if you're already owning it or you've already read it we'll give you another one but yeah yeah, yeah. you get three words on whether you like a book yeah so we've got this we've got three books for so we've got two two books each three words to describe each book and I'm going to try and guess the books uh, I don't know how well that's going to go um, but then I'm going to pick one of the two. Yeah. And, right, and same for Scott, yeah? Yeah, so... Can we do my books for you first? Sure. I haven't wrapped them, because that's not how I roll. They're in boxes. The little box says, Trans Historical Mystery. And the shoe box says, I can't believe I own this. Political. Not quite heist. Trans historical mystery. Are you going to attempt to guess what they are? Um, trans historical mystery. I, I'm trans and historical is really hard mm -hmm. here. I'm going to guess that it's historical fiction that's written new, and I'm going to guess that it is. A Natasha Pulley book because I don't know if Natasha Pulley has written a trans character but it's the sort of thing that she would write okay. so I'm going to go for maybe Pepper Harrow okay 
Confessions of the Fox by Geordie Rosenberg. Uh, Geordie Rosenberg is a trans author. <laughs> so I got it wrong. Yes. That's awesome. I read six trans authors last month and. And they all seemed to work. Um, they went. They were from good to amazing. Yeah. So, um, and yeah. What did I reject? You rejected. Here's the clues. I can't believe I own this political not quite heist. No idea. The Taliban cricket club. <laughs> no, I can't believe I own this because cricket is banned in our house because I fucking hate it. Um. It's political because it's about the Taliban and stuff. Yeah. Plenty of cricketers have become politicians. Imran Khan. Um, and the Not Quite Heist is... It's supposed to be about an escape. You thought Nell's rapping was dodgy. We have got... This one wrapped in a black paper bag, which something got delivered in recently. And we have the pizza box. Alright, what are my clues? So, I've, uh, I've put a twist on the twist. Of course you have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Scott's not playing by the rules. Shocking. I have got nine words. Three words to describe both books. Three words to describe each book. So, both of these books. Mm-hmm. Relationships. Mm-hmm. Booker and Woman Prize Longlisted. Mm-hmm. Depression. Yeah. The book in the bag, dementia, mm-hmm. cults, mm-hmm. daughters. So that's burnt sugar. The book in the pizza box, sexuality, minimal punctuate, punctuation, Marxism. I'm going to guess normal people. And I'm going to take... Oh, I'm going to take the book in the bag. He looks very pleased, which makes me think I got the wrong. <gasps> Burnt sugar! I'm correct. <laughs> I am so smart. I am so smart. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was quite impressive that you got normal people. I thought you'd get burnt sugar because cults, daughters. Dementia. Dementia. Like, I thought that that was... That yeah. is quite guessable. So you're going to read Burnt Sugar. So we read Burnt Sugar. Yeah. And you're going to read The Confessions of the Fox. Yeah. Um, I think that's it. That's it. I think you just stole him. I am, and it's gone on for quite long enough, this video. Yeah. Okay. I love you. Bye.